Welcome to Module 7, Part 2. In this part, I will describe and give examples of the diacritics used to modify vowel position, raising, lowering, fronting, and backing. I will also describe and give examples of the diacritics used for aspirated, unaspirated, and unreleased stops. For the most part, I will go over these variants or allophones fairly briefly. There are longer descriptions and several examples provided in the textbook. I encourage you to review the reading carefully for further detail, especially as regards the contexts in which the allophones occur. It is common in the pronunciation of different regional dialects and in the speech of non-native English speakers for a vowel to be produced that is somewhat different than the production of standard speakers of the language. Often, it may sound as if the vowel is between two vowels. Even within the standard dialect, many vowels have different allophones or versions of the vowel that are produced differently depending on context. There are four diacritics that allow us to transcribe small differences in the articulatory position of vowels. They are the raising, lowering, fronting, and backing diacritics. For each one, you can imagine it as pointing in the direction of the change from the center of the vowel's standard position. First, an example of fronting is the way that some people from the Northeast say the ah sound. It's produced further forward than ah, but not far enough forward to be ah. Listen, ah versus ah, or Boston versus Baston. Next, an example of backing might occur in words in which a vowel occurs before a dark L. The velarization tends to pull the vowel back somewhat and make it more back. In the case of schwa, it might make it sound more like u. Uh. Listen to these examples. Bottle versus bottom. Can you hear the difference in the pronunciation of the schwa in bottle being a bit further back than the schwa and bottom? Bottle, bottom. An example of raising occurs frequently when the diphthong I occurs preceding a voiceless consonant like in the word white. Listen to the difference in pronunciation of the diphthong in wide versus white. In wide, the vowel starts at a lower jaw position than in the word white. In white, the first part of the vowel is raised more towards the mid-central vowel a. Uh. Listen again, i versus i wide versus white. You can use the raising diacritic on the first part of the diphthong to indicate the change in jaw height. Sometimes the raising is great enough that some people would transcribe it as a phonemic substitution using turned V instead of the normal transcription. Vowels are also often raised before nasal consonants, especially with a ah in certain dialects. So the a ah in tan or thanks might be raised compared to the a ah preceding non-nasal consonants. Listen to the difference in the a ah in tan versus tap. Tan, tap. Finally, an example of vowel lowering might be the production of the uh sound that is produced with a lower jaw position than normal. In this case, it would move towards something like the ah sound, but it would not be a complete substitution, somewhere between the two. This difference might be common for some non-native English speakers who may have the low vowel in their first language, but not the mid-central vowel. These speakers may confuse a uh and ah, uh, or produce a vowel that is between the two. I've definitely heard the substitution pattern in Chinese accented English, Russian accented English, and sometimes in Spanish accented English. For example, listen to the word cup as I produce it two different ways and then the word cop. Cup, cup, cop. Notice how the second version sounds somewhat in between 
the uh and the ah, uh, or the cup and the cop. Oftentimes, when transcribing regional dialects or non-native English, you may have trouble deciding which vowel a talker produced. The vowel may sound in between two vowels, or you may feel that you hear one vowel and then the other as you replay the word. In this case, you can try to figure out which vowels the production is between, and then use diacritics to indicate which vowel it is closer to and which vowel the production is moving towards. For example, if I thought that the vowel in a production of pan sounded in between a and e, I would try to decide which vowel it was closer to, let's say a, and use the raising diacritic to show that the vowel is moved towards a, but is not all the way there. However, if you really think that one vowel is just substituted for another, don't go crazy with the diacritics. Just transcribe the substitution. For example, I've noticed that I sometimes say thanks for thanks when I'm speaking quickly. In that case, if it's really thanks, then I would just transcribe the a without the diacritics. It would be an extreme version of raising. Using these vowel diacritics may seem hard at first, but it allows you to transcribe differences that you notice and to work with a client to produce a vowel that is more like native speaker expectations. If you were working with a non-native English speaker as a client, for example. For practical purposes in this course, don't agonize too much over which vowel you might think a production is closer to if it's in between. If the vowel were between a and a, and you transcribed it as either raised a or lowered a, I would mark either as correct, and I'd be really happy that you heard that it was in between the two. The vowel diacritic exercises in your book will help you to get used to thinking about and transcribing these diacritics. Now we will cover three stop diacritics. In English, the first two will be used only with voiceless stops. The third of the diacritics can be used with voiced or voiceless stops. We have already begun to transcribe some allophones of t and d when we learned about the glottal stop, which can be an allophone of t, and the alveolar flap, which can be an allophone of either t or d. Now we will learn to transcribe additional allophones that are common across all voiceless stops. First, let's discuss aspirated versus unaspirated voiceless stops. Listen to the difference between the t in toe and the t in sto. Toe versus sto. Can you hear how there's an extra puff of air after the release of the stop in toe? This extra puff of air does not occur after the t in sto. Sto. This puff of air is known as aspiration, and it happens because the vocal folds are in the open or abducted state at the release of the stop consonant and it takes them a little while to get close enough together for voicing to begin after the release of the stop. In an unaspirated voiceless stop, the time between the release of the stop and the onset of the voicing is much shorter, so that the extra puff of air is not heard. The occurrence of the different allophones of the voiceless stops is governed by phonological rules in English. The aspirated t occurs in the syllable onset when the voiceless stop is alone, like in the word toe, or when it is the first phoneme in a consonant cluster. When the voiceless stop follows another consonant in the onset, like the fricative s, then it is not aspirated, like in the word sto. We transcribe the aspirated stop with a superscript h to the right of the phoneme. Let's hear some examples. Pay, T, key. Now let's hear some examples using the unaspirated voiceless stops. Spy, sty, and sky. 
The unaspirated voiceless stops are transcribed with a small superscript equal sign above and to the right of the consonant. It might help you to remember it to think of it as open lips. Now let's listen to how it sounds if I put the allophone in the wrong context. Let's try putting the aspirated stop after the S. Spy, sty, sky. So it's important to be able to describe which allophone was used, because if a speaker uses the wrong allophone in a given context, the word won't sound right. But we would have no way of indicating this difference using only broad transcription. The unaspirated voiceless stop can also occur in the syllable coda, but it alternates with another allophone, the unreleased stop. In the unreleased stop, oral closure is made for the stop, but then it is not released, or it is not released until the articulators have moved to a different position for a following consonant. For example, listen to these two pronunciations of the p at the end of the word sap. Sap versus sap. In both cases, the lips close to make the p sound, but in the second case, the closure is not released. Sometimes it might be hard to hear whether the consonant is really there or not, but we know the p is there because the word is not sa. Listen, sap versus sa. Unlike the first two allophones, the unreleased stop can be an allophone of either a voiced or a voiceless stop. The released voiced stops in English are normally unaspirated, so we don't add the unaspirated diacritics for the voiced stops, but we do add a diacritic for unreleased for both voiced and voiceless stops. Let's listen to some examples. Sad versus sad. Sack versus sack. Sub versus sub. We transcribe the unreleased allophone of stop consonants as a small superscript corner above and to the right of the symbol. It helps to think of it as a closed door, to remember that it's the one where the oral closure is not released. While either the released or unreleased versions of the stops can occur in many contexts, it's unusual for the aspirated voiceless stops to occur in the coda position unless it's for emphasis. For example, it's a bit unusual to hear somebody say sip as sip unless they are emphasizing the word. After a vowel doesn't always mean that a consonant is in the coda, however. For example, the t in the word attain is aspirated because it's in the onset of the second syllable rather than in the coda of the first syllable, while the k in bicker is in the coda of the first syllable, not the onset of the second syllable. The rules governing English syllable structure are complex, but the short story is that stressed syllables tend to attract consonants that could go with either syllable. Furthermore, a client with a speech or language impairment or a foreign accent won't always follow these rules, so you really need to learn to hear the differences between the allophones in order to transcribe them correctly especially clinically. Another context where you are likely to observe unreleased stops is as the first consonant in a consonant cluster in the syllable coda. For example, in the word lept, the p is likely to be unreleased because the oral closure is not released until the release of the t. You just change articulatory position before the release. Let's listen to it both ways lept versus lept. You might think that the p is just not there in these cases and be tempted not to transcribe it, but if it were deleted, the word would be let. Listen, lept versus let. To get used to transcribing these three allophones and remembering the contexts in which they occur, you need to complete the relevant exercises in your textbook. This is the end of part two.